Hey guys, so before we get into today's video, I wanted to ask if you have had the chance to check out Quick Media on YouTube. Greg Matson is one of my favorite Latter-day Saint commentators about how current events and culture interface with the church and its institutions. A BYU protest took place this week, part of a national protest. Post in this episode, we are talking about what I call President Nelson's identity hierarchy that the church is reacting to a trend in, in history where... Greg understands well the ideological forces at play in today's society, and he does a great job of breaking down how faithful Latter-day Saints should frame the crazy world that we live in. So check him out. Just search for Quick Media, that's C-W-I-C Media, on YouTube, and be sure to subscribe. So for the past year, I've been studying the New Testament and teaching it to my seminary students. Now, I want to emphasize how important this collection of writings is. The New Testament, more than any other collection of writings, formed our Western conceptions of what is right and wrong. Regardless of people's belief in Jesus' divinity, the cultural impact of the New Testament message and ideas formed the moral consciousness that undergirds almost all all other products of Western culture. Again, I can't understate this. You just would not have Western civilization without the New Testament. But more on this later. Many critics of the Bible love to cherry-pick verses from the scriptures, but rarely are able to steal man the overall message and themes of the entire thing. Sure, we can all find verses in Scripture that we can quibble over, but what is the actual overall message of the Bible, and specifically the overall message of the New Testament? That is what I want to address here, and I will just start by asking the question, what is the New Testament? Well, simply put, it's a collection of writings from first century Jews telling the world about the coming of a new king and a new kingdom. But this means that the New Testament is a part two. It's a continuation of another story. Part one, the original story, is what we call the Old Testament, or the first half of the Bible. And it's the history of the Jewish people. The story of the Jews in the Old Testament is the story of the rise and fall of a kingdom. The Old Testament contains the Torah, which is the origin stories of this kingdom, wherein God, after creating the world, enters into a special relationship with the tribal people of Abraham. Then, through the epic story of Moses, God brings this people to a promised land to establish his kingdom. However, this story does not have a happy ending. It ends with the fall of that kingdom as the people turn away from God. I think the Bible becomes so much more clear when you understand it as the story of a kingdom. Part one is about the rise and fall of that kingdom, and part two is about its return, but in ways that no one expected. Part two, or what we call the New Testament, are the records of people from the first century who were proclaiming that something incredible had happened. The kingdom had returned, but people had misunderstood what kind of a kingdom God was trying to establish. Now, the first three books of the New Testament were something like missionary tracts to different audiences created by people or their associates who personally knew Jesus. And the story begins in the context of an oppressed Jewish people lamenting the fall of their kingdom and looking to their scriptures for hope in the promises of a restoration of that kingdom. The unorthodox Jew, John the Baptist, comes from the wilderness, proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is coming back soon. There is an anticipation for someone to arise as the great savior of the Jewish people who will come and throw off the political subjugation that they face and restore their people to their former glory. But the story takes an unusual turn when the hero of the story is not a warrior king, like everyone expected, leading the Jews in a great revolt against their enemies, but instead the hero of the story is a 30-year-old construction worker 
who tells his followers to love their oppressors, and who tells a litany of parables about the kingdom of God being something very different than what people were expecting. The story is one of confusion among the Jews and his followers as this Jesus is clearly someone who is able to do miraculous things, but who does not fit the mold of the Messiah they were expecting. Jesus may have been coming to bring a new kingdom to the world, but this kingdom was based on a very different kind of law. The central and fundamental law of the new kingdom that Christ was bringing can be summarized in one word, love. Love was the law of the new kingdom and is perhaps the central animating force at work in all of the New Testament's message. But that's a subject I'll get a little more into later in this video. The story of Jesus ends with his crucifixion by the Romans, who were being told by Jesus' enemies that this new kingdom was actually an insurrectionist threat to Rome. And so in his death, all the hopes of his followers were dashed. With him being put in the tomb, his fate as a fraud rather than as the Messiah seemed to have been sealed. The last thing, the Messiah, the redeemer of the kingdom, was supposed to be, was killed by his enemies. But the very reason the gospel writers wrote down their stories was because of what happened next. Because from this moment of absolute disillusion came the validation of everything that Jesus had said when he rose from the dead. Just imagine going from absolute disillusion to utter joy when everything that you a moment before thought was a fraud had been validated. This spirit of jubilation at the glorious validation of what they were doing represents the animating spirit behind the first century Christian movement. The gospel means the good news, and the good news was that Jesus rose from the dead and thus validated that not only was he not a fraud, he was Lord over even death itself. The king had indeed arrived. Whatever people had thought about the kingdom before was irrelevant. With the arrival of the new king, everything was to be oriented towards him. The first three books of the New Testament were written in response to a need to spread that story and the arrival of the new king to the broader world. So these were written either directly or under the direction of actual eyewitnesses of the miraculous events. The first three were written to tell the story to the Jews and the Gentiles, while the fourth account, the Gospel of John, was written later to the early church members who already knew the basic story but longed for more information and theological detail. And this is the first half of the New Testament, the part that is called the Gospels or the story of Jesus while he was with his disciples. The second half of the New Testament deals with the earliest followers of Christ who sought to fulfill his commission by establishing that kingdom in the world. The second half of the New Testament contains the Acts of the Apostles, which gives an account of the early history of the movement's leaders and its formation into a church and spans from around 33 AD until the early 60s AD. The rest of the New Testament are letters written by the earliest authorities of the church, largely during that same period of 33-ish to around the early 60s AD. The second half of the New Testament is largely the story of leaders doing their best under divine direction to establish this new kingdom in the world, a kingdom like no other. It was clear that Jesus was not merely reestablishing the old political kingdom in the land of Palestine and freeing Jews from Rome. Jesus brought a message that was mind-blowingly different. It was a message that proclaimed that he was the king of kings and had come to bring redemption to all people, everywhere, and not just from political oppression, but from sin and death and the very broken and unfair nature of this world. Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. It was not a kingdom built to use force and violence against oppressors like Rome and thus conquer the world from the outside in, but instead it was designed to conquer the world by transforming man from the inside out. The idea was to transform this world by bringing mankind into a new kind of relationship with their Father in heaven and with one another. 
and thus they would prepare a heavenly kingdom on earth ready to receive Jesus Christ upon his eventual return as the final chapter in human history. The letters of the New Testament and the last book called Revelation are a sordid collection of early church leaders seeking to convey the vision of this new kingdom to others while dealing with various issues of their time. So as I mentioned before, people may take some verses from the New Testament to make some kind of rhetorical point. However, what happens if you step back and look at the entire narrative and ask questions like, what is the overall message here? What are the major themes of the New Testament? What is this collection of first century writings trying to convey? Well, probably the central message of the New Testament is the idea that God has come to save not only the people of Israel from their oppressors, but people everywhere, and not only from all oppression, but from all suffering and evil, if they will enter into a new kind of relationship with God and one another. The idea was that through faith as an abiding trust in Christ, they could ultimately bring about a new world as they followed the new king of kings. This broadening of the scope of God's love and grace to all mankind was revolutionary in the world at that time. The gods were as deeply tribal at that time as the people. But Jesus' message of a kingdom where all were equals in the eyes of God and equally entitled to his grace is a key to the New Testament message, and it had lasting impacts throughout human history. The next major theme is the idea of love. Now, I don't think any other work in human history has ever dealt with the concept and philosophy of love more profoundly than the New Testament. Love, instead of being a side topic, is central. It presents love as the sacrificial act for the welfare of another, as a willing the good of the other without thought of one's own recompense. This desire for the good of another above even your own life was to be the central animating spirit in this new way of being human in God's kingdom. Love in the New Testament was not a shallow niceness or mere toleration. Instead, Jesus framed love as the radical idea of valuing another person as much as you value yourself regardless of who they were. And I just can't state how radical that idea was in the context of the Greco-Roman world. Another major theme in the New Testament is the concept of transformation from the inside out rather than from the outside in. The idea was that the Spirit of God would give you a new heart, and this would transform you and any individual or society that embraces that Spirit. The message of the New Testament is not about changing social systems, but rather about changing individual human hearts and their relationship to God and to one another. The idea is that the kingdom of God starts within you and then grows outward to fill all the earth and all aspects of our human relationships. And this leads to the final theme that I had mentioned earlier, the idea of a new kingdom. This is the concept that individuals who have transformed and been reborn into a new kind of life through Jesus would, as a group, emerge as a new kind of society, a new social order, an order of people who voluntarily would be living lives of cooperation and love for one another, a people who would be a light on a hill for the world to see. The program was not only about an afterlife, but about this world. Jesus wanted his disciples to make the world more heavenly. He wanted his kingdom to come on earth as in heaven. The call to the disciples was to bring heaven and earth closer together through this new kingdom, this new society. In the end, the New Testament is the story of a new kingdom being ushered by a new king of the world. This king seeks to establish a new way of being human, rooted in a loving relationship with God and your fellow man.
So why all the conflicts within Christian history, right? I can just hear the critics saying that right now. This is a great vision, but that is not what Christian history has looked like. Well, the reality is that from the very beginning, Jesus was bringing a very subversive message to existing power structures in the world. Like a skilled warrior behind enemy lines, Christ dropped a depth charge beneath the surface of the ancient world and culture and began a revolution to transform it. And that didn't happen all at once. But the most shocking thing about it is that it has been wildly successful. The ancient world was a world totally foreign in its values and paradigms to our own. The story of the past 2,000 years in the West should be largely shown as a march of progress out of the ethics of the ancient world into what we now consider a more enlightened age. However, what standard are we using to judge our progress? It's certainly not the Roman standard. It's certainly not the standard of any other group. Upon closer examination, you'll notice that the standards we use for evaluating progress are profoundly Christian. We seek to create societies of human equality, human dignity, with all being treated equally and as equally valuable and worthy of respect and love. This was not the vision of Rome. It was not the vision of the Mongols. It was not the vision of the Aztecs or the barbarian tribes of Germany. But it became the vision of our society increasingly once the New Testament was released from the grip of the Catholic Church and spread to the masses. The reality is that when the printing press caused the Catholic Church to lose its control over the distribution and understanding of the New Testament, a revolution took place. And it was revolution after revolution that began to occur in the West due to a new moral consciousness amongst Western peoples. With the Bible, and specifically the New Testament, as its new authority, the authority of popes and kings began to be challenged, and universal dignity of all mankind began to become more and more apparent. So it is no coincidence that the release of the New Testament precipitated the Reformation, and that the Reformation and its ideas precipitated the Enlightenment, whose ideas to this day form the bedrock of Western civilization and the values that civilization has carried into the broader world in the formation of institutions and notions like universal human rights and international law. Without a doubt, the New Testament, and specifically its broad release in the 16th century, has over the past five centuries reshaped the moral consciousness of the world. And it is my contention that this is because the narrative is fundamentally true. Jesus of Nazareth did indeed rise from the dead, and he stands as the king of the world, seeking to establish his kingdom on earth through us as we enter into a new, special kind of relationship with him and with one another. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.